to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Hi, everyone. We're back with a brand new episode on the Leo Training Podcast. This week's guest is Dr. Michael Hartle and his son, Marcus. This is a special Father's Day episode. In this episode, we will be discussing the Strong First SFL, the barbell certification, the track and field and build up to the Rio Olympics, strength training for junior athletes, how to prepare for the five-minute kettlebell snatch test at the level one and level two Strong First certifications by primarily uh, coming off of a barbell training program, as well as debunking some common strength training myths. So before we roll into the episode, let me take a moment and tell you a little bit more about this week's guest, Dr. Michael Hartle. Dr. Michael Hartle is a chiropractic physician, a board certified clinical nutritionist, a certified chiropractic sports physician, a certified strength and conditioning specialist, the chief SFL barbell instructor and master SFG instructor with Strong First, and an active release technique provider since 1995. He is also the co developer of the Strong First SFL barbell certification. Dr. Hartle was raised in the frozen tundra known as Minnesota. He once lived in Hawaii while his father was stationed at Pearl Harbor during Vietnam. He has been practicing in Fort Wayne, Indiana for the last 21 years a former nationally ranked powerlifter who has won several national titles with USA Powerlifting, Dr. Michael Hartle is also the formal chairman and founder of the Sports Medicine Committee of USA Powerlifting. He was the head coach of the USA Powerlifting World Bench Press team for eight years with the team winning the 2004 World Championship team title. His best competition lifts are 705-pound squat, 535 pound bench press and 635 pound dead, deadlift with a best combined total of the three lifts of 1,840 pounds in the 275 pound weight class. For the last 10 years, he has been playing semi pro football, defensive tackle, and loving it. His football team, the Adams County Patriots, won the National AA Semi Pro Football Championship in 2008. He treats, trains, and advises to all kinds of patients from babies to the elderly, from youth athletes to NCAA student athletes to professional athletes. He also coaches junior high football and track and field, volunteering his time for the last 16 years. He has three sons and two grandchildren who keep him busy with their personal endeavors, including crawling, hockey, football, lacrosse, track and field, and of course, academics. So, Before we roll into the episode, I just want to take a moment and wish all the fathers out there a very special, happy Father's Day. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Hartle and his son Marcus with the episode, Plan the Work, Work the Plan. Dr. Hartle and your son Marcus, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. I'm very excited to have you both on for a very special Father's Day episode. Uh, thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come on to the show. Well, thank you very much. We'd be honored to be here. <laughs> you can say something too, Marcus. <laughs> That's awesome. No, thanks. Thank you both for coming on. Um, we got a uh, f- fantastic material uh, in store for the audience. A lot of ground we're going to cover in uh, multiple multiple areas. Um, but before we get into that, um, I would like to take a moment, you know, for those in my audience that are listening in that aren't familiar with you and your work, um, you know, you're the chief SFL for Strong First and a master SFG as well as a doctor of chiropractic. So I'd love for you to take a couple of minutes. Uh, you can introduce yourself and then, and then uh, Marcus, you can introduce yourself as well and kind of talk about, um, you know, your work. And then Marcus, you could talk about what you're, what you're doing in school currently in the sports you're playing. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Hartle, originally from uh, Minnesota. Uh, I was born in uh, California. My dad was in the Navy during Vietnam, so I spent some time in Idaho, California, Hawaii, uh, which was rough, uh, obviously, to live in Hawaii for a few years. Uh, when, dad, uh, 
Dad got out of the Navy after Vietnam was over. I uh, moved back to Minnesota, where he was originally from. So that's when I first uh, discovered the uh, frozen stuff known as snow. Uh, uh, but I was raised there in Minnesota. Um, been a doctor of chiropractic for 22 years. I've uh, been here in Indiana for about 20 years now. Uh, before that, I worked for some doctors up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and everything else. So I'm both a Vikings and Packers fan, so it's kind of an interesting conundrum. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, they kind of force you, you know, at gunpoint in, in the Green Bay to become a Packer fan. You, had, you have to do that, you know. So my second son was born there uh, and everything else there. But uh, so I've been here in Indiana. Um, in 2000, uh, I competed in powerlifting until 2005. Um, in 2006, I stopped powerlifting uh, temporarily to uh, play semi-pro football, which I've been doing for the last 10 years. And then also I went to uh, my first uh, kettlebell certification with, uh, with Pavel. And so I got introduced to Pavel and his methods of, uh, as far as the kettlebell, which at that point I had a few kettlebells, but they were just gathering dust in the corner, uh, more of, uh, pulling the floor mass down, you know, with, uh, with gravity. And, uh, so I got introduced to that. And obviously I've been doing barbells since I was 18. So I've been, uh, kind of re- reverse as far as a lot of people and at strong first, they get introduced to the barbell after kettlebell, where I was inv- introduced to the kettlebell after barbell. Uh, so I've been using kettlebells for quite a while and it's actually, uh, helped out quite a bit with my, uh, training and conditioning for playing semi-pro football, which obviously has different demands on the body than uh, as far as what uh, powerlifting does. Um, in 2013, uh, Strong First was created did it with Pavel and uh, followed him there. And then in 2000, the same time to, uh, frame, uh, Pavel and I got together, put our brains together, and created the uh, Strong First Lifter, the SFL program part of Strong First. Uh, as you know, Strong First has a kind of an interesting uh, uh, timeline where it has body weight, it also has kettlebells, and it has also barbells. So we have everything from no equipment to minimal equipment with kettlebells to having barbells where you obviously do need some more equipment with that. Um, and so then we put on our first uh, barbell certification, SFL certification, in uh, June of 2013 with Fabio Zonin and Thomas Pessi over in uh, Italy. Uh, Vincenza, Italy, and been going strong for three years now. And we just had our 22nd SFL in Boston last weekend with a very good success at Mike Perry's place. And uh, so there we go. So that's kind of where uh, my background. I'm also uh, uh, board certified nutrition, sports medicine, um, also a CSCS as well, too, with the NSCA and everything else with that. So I have uh, three sons. Uh, my oldest lives in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, uh, with uh, his wife and my uh, Two and uh, almost third uh, grandchild. Uh, my second son's 21. And then I also have my youngest son, Marcus, here, who's uh, 14. And then I have uh, two stepsons, uh, Cole and Joey, who are uh, 13 and 11, uh, and everything else with uh, my fiance as far as Leslie. So awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Very cool. Um, Marcus. Take a, take a moment, introduce yourself uh, to the audience, and you, you can talk about whatever you want, what you're, uh, what you're working on in school right now and, um, you know, in track and field and football. Hi, I'm Marcus Hartle, Dr. Michael Hartle's son. And I'm at 14 years of age, and I'm currently training with him to get stronger and better fit for football, hockey, lacrosse, and maybe track and field, possibly. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Very well, cool. He, he just did five years of uh, junior high track with me, but as he goes into high school, he has to limit some of his sports just because of the requirements and everything else. Uh, uh, this last year, he did five sports uh, in his junior high, uh, six, sorry, uh, six sports with that. And so, uh, of course, he uh, had to get the requisite grades to be able to accomplish that. But, uh, uh, but yes, so uh, very proud of Marcus, as I am all my, my all my sons and everything else. But uh, as he enters his freshman year in high school, so. That's awesome. That's very, that's really cool to see too, that you have such diversity among the sports as well. That's great. Do you have a, do you have a favorite one that you uh, like more than the others? Hockey is definitely my favorite sport. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, so since we, since we just kind of kick things off that way, um, are you cool with, uh, instead of kind of start with the SFL, we talk about kind of working with your son and, and training him. Oh, please do. Yeah. All right. So let's do that. So um, I'm very curious to know, um, you know, big, big sort of topic um, right now is early sports specialization um, and, you know, the concern with, with, uh, you know, junior athletes focusing on one sport very early on and, you know, developing uh, injuries in that regard. So Marcus is obviously, 
playing multiple sports and you have him strength training. Um, so what, what are some of the things that, that you have him doing and focusing on, um, you know, at, at uh, 14? 14. 14. So at 14 years of age. Well, you know, one of the things back to the specialization real quick is that, you know, as a uh, practicing doctor of chiropractic and, and working with sports medicine, you know, it's uh, many times that I see patients, uh, young patients that come into my office that, you know, they're, uh, they're swimming year round. Uh, they're playing basketball year round. They're doing these kind of things at young ages. Uh, perfect examples. We had a, a patient uh, last year came in, age 13, a uh, very good uh, female swimmer, um, but she had uh, bilateral neuropathy in both hands. And you're thinking about that, you think, okay, there's no other disease process, there's no spinal tumor or anything else going on with that. Um, and she has neuropathy in both hands. And you know, those are things you see in, you know, adults. Those are things you see in someone who's 30 or 40 years old because of job or whatever else or whiplash injuries or something like that. And here at age 13, she had that. Well, she had, of course, a uh, kind of a kyphotic posture, shoulders rounded forward, <laughs> neck going forward. A very good swimmer, spent, you know, did thousands of meters in the pool and all that stuff on a weekly basis. So one of the things I talked to her parents about was the fact, okay, I can help her, you know, help her get better. We can get rid of the, the issue of the nerve entrapments and all that stuff and fix her and get her better. But they also think too, as I said, she needs to start doing at least one to two other sports during the year. And I said, they don't have to be, you know, high uh, level sports. They can be rec sports. They can be intramural sports, whatever else, but get her involved. So they chose uh, volleyball and soccer, uh, something that was obviously different than the uh, water-based sport that she was involved in and everything else. And, so not only with the right treatments, the right rehab exercises and things like that, uh, but she also got better and we were able to get rid of, you know, that neuropathy and make her also a better swimmer. Um, but it's one of those things, again, too, that we see as far as the kids I coach uh, at uh, St. John's, which was the grade school that uh, Marcus used to go to, uh, that you got kids playing basketball year round. And the studies show that two things usually happen, those kids who specialize too early, is they, one, they suffer from uh, emotional burnout because they're doing the same thing all the time. And, you know, kids are always like squirrel or, you know, ADD, all that kind of stuff, <laughs> uh, you know, whether they actually truly are diagnosed or not, but they, you know, they have their attention span is a lot less. So doing something different keeps their attention, you know, more focused. Uh, the other thing too, is as far as the cumulative trauma on the body by doing the same thing. And that's whether you're 13 or 14 or you're a professional NHL hockey player. You know, you got to get out of your sport. You know, Pavel said one thing many years ago, uh, and other other teachers have said the same thing: that don't live in your sport. And in the case, this case, also with me as 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 a doctor, don't live in your workplace either. So if you're always at a workplace and you're moving your body from right to left, moving apart down a line or something like that, you have to do things to combat that. Otherwise, your body's going to start taking over that type of posture. Um, and same thing with these kids who are playing, say, basketball year round. Uh, they're constantly never doing anything where they're doing a, uh, let's say a full, uh, squat. You know, they're always doing a partial squat when you're betting basketball. There's a lot of eccentric stress as far as around the knee joint, the ankles, the hips, and all that kind of stuff, uh, which affects, of course, the lower back and things like that. So these kids never get to do anything. So one thing that Marcus, and we did this with our other sons as well, too, that we had them do different sports. And so Marcus, you know, will play, and usually what he did the last couple of years, you start out with football, right? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. and then halfway through football season, hockey starts to get going. So we, of course, have to manage the time with that. Uh, football's done. Hockey goes on. Then basketball gets started. Um, and even though basketball is a little bit of a, a frustrating sport for Marcus because he's usually fairly good at most sports. And that was one where as hurdles, we're not very good basketball players. Uh, you know, if you want your car moved, we'll move your car. <laughs> You know, if you want to do stuff, we just don't have a lot of the, uh, you know, no one in my family except my, my uh, younger brother was fairly good at basketball, but still. At Kleenex basketball. At Kleenex basketball. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, but there, but again, there we did that. And then we did in the springtime, we did the soccer and track and field, soccer for junior highs in the springtime here. So you can see he had a lot of different stresses on his body throughout the time. Never specialized in one sport. And it wasn't until about the last two years that he started to show some improvement. Obviously, there, there's puberty there. There's hormones, all that kind of stuff that kicks mm -hmm. in as well, too. But you can see, you know, he hasn't really suffered from any uh, major injuries, little nicks here, little stuff, stuff like that. But nothing of a nature where you see an overuse type injury that is, you know, we see as far as coming in our office all the time. Right. Like, um, it, it's becoming more prevalent. Um, the num the higher incidence of Tommy John surgeries in high school baseball players, for example. Very much so. Very much so. Which is something that, you know, first off, you never saw it till you saw it in, uh, 
more aged uh, baseball, professional baseball players getting those. Then they started almost doing it as elective surgery for some of these uh, baseball players. We're saying, well, you're a pitcher, so we're just going to go ahead and do Tommy John surgery because you're going to eventually need it, but we're going to go ahead and do it now. And then, like you said, we're, yeah, exactly. You know, we're, you're, you're saying now we have kids that are in the college, even high school, that are getting these things done. Wow, that's that's incredible. Well, that's that's fantastic that Marcus is again doing a lot of different sports, a lot of different movements, breaking it up. Um, so, my next question is um, in terms of weight training for him. You know, at 14, uh, entering into the ninth grade and everything. So. What, what are, what's some of the things that you are focusing on him with? And then, uh, maybe some recommendations for the audience. If they have, uh, you know, parents are listening, they have kids that are, they're in high school. They should be focusing on for that age as well. Well, first, you know, one of the things I want to debunk is the typical myth that, you know, if a kid starts weightlifting training too early, it'll stunt their growth. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I was going to ask you that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and, and, I, and I don't have any uh, citations or research in front of you. They're just things I've learned, and there are out there. So you can certainly Google them or go to the National Library of Medicine and look these things up. But I remember being at the um, uh, NSCA convention in 2004 in Minneapolis. And actually, uh, interesting, I met Stu McGill at that one. So uh, you had a great podcast with him recently, so that was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's awesome that you checked that out. Very cool. Yeah. And actually, at that same uh, NSCA convention, I met Pavel. So, I mean, I met a, you know, a couple of two guys that were very influential as far as in my life. Anyways, there was a speaker there that brought up the fact that when kids start weight training at an early age, okay, we're talking, obviously, um, submax. We're not doing PRs, all the 1RMs, that kind of stuff. But what it does, it actually increases the amount of production of testosterone and growth hormone at an earlier age. Now, now when I say that, I'm not referring to the fact that they're going to you know, have uh, Marfan syndrome where they're going to have a Cro-Magnon type forehead or whatever else because they started so early. Uh, <laughs> right. Even though they're using, you know, endogenous hormones, meaning they're not using any type of uh, something outside their body. Um, but it also increases, just like it does for us adults, their bone density. Well, if you got a kid that's playing hockey, and even with USA Hockey rules now that they don't allow them to check until they're in the uh, Bantams. Bantam levels and stuff like that, where they're in there probably, what, 13, 14 years of age. You used uh-huh. to do it earlier. You get some kid that doesn't skate very well, and he falls down and hits the boards. There's still a tremendous amount of force on his body going on, even if no one touched him. Sure. You know? So if you get a kid that's doing a contact sport like that, even though he, he's initiating the contact himself, and if you do some type of uh, weight training with them, you're going to increase their bone density and allow them to possibly decrease the chance as far as the you know, green stick fractures, you know, spiral fracture, you know, stress fracture, or even bigger ones, um, that kind of thing. Now, obviously, like I said before, that's, you know, we're not doing one RMs. We're not doing heavy max, like something like I would do because my body's done growing, right? or you would do as well, too. Um, but we do a sub max with that. One of the things that's interesting with that, too, is that when these kids are doing it, you know, they need to obviously have a supervised program. They need yes. to have someone who's, who's, you know, uh, certified, but someone who knows what they're doing watching them. But here's what's interesting. Okay. So you get a sport like soccer. Soccer has a highest race rate of injuries of any sport out there. That was a, a study I read in the NSA journal many years ago. So more than hockey, more than football, more than wrestling, all that stuff. And yet those are sports that have referees. Those are sports that have coaches, the people who teach these kids how to do things. It's just the nature of the sport. Weight training is so far down that list. You can't even read it as far as that. Wow. You know, so obviously, but like Marcus was telling me today, um, his girlfriend goes to one of the local public schools here. And what did they, what did they tell you that her older sister? No, her, they just pretty much told them to like, they showed them how to do it like one time and then they're like, go do it without supervision. Wow. You know, yeah. so again, there's a situation where, yeah, you can get hurt, but you get hurt at any time. Right. Uh, um, you know, so again, like in Wisconsin, you know, they used to do some, uh, I know some rodeos up there. They got kids riding, you know, uh, small horses or whatever else young. They could fall off and obviously injure themselves. You know, kids climb trees, not as much nowadays as they did when I was younger um, and everything else. Um, <laughs> but, you know, still you can fall out of that, break a collarbone or whatever else kind of thing. So the incident of weight training injuries for young kids, you know, is, is very small. Um, but again, you know, we started with uh, our two older sons. We started them doing some stuff when they were nine and 10 years old, but they were learning technique. Right. They were not focused right. on weight. It was more like having fun. Uh, matter of fact, my oldest son, uh, when he was a uh, sophomore in high school, he competed in the IPF, which is the International Powerlifting Federation Sub Junior World Championships that we had actually held here in Fort Wayne. Wow. Uh, and he did very well. And it was actually interesting because it was his third meet ever in his life, and he qualified it on his second meet. And we had people saying, how long has Marcus been lifting? 
And I said, this is only his third competition. And they're like, mm-hmm. a, they were just, a, I say, Marcus? Yeah. Oh, Colin. He's probably going <laughs> to listen to this and, you know, shoot me for saying that. Um, <laughs> Colin. Marcus is right here. Um, so yeah, I mean, he one time I even called my kids a cat name one time when I was rattling out their names. Uh, but anyways, the uh, Colin, it was the third meet ever. And because we had focused so much on his technique that it was a subconscious thing, as we know, we teach that in Strong First all the time, um, that when he was lifting, yeah, he wasn't the strongest kid there, but his form and technique were impeccable, you know, because he was drilled that, drilled that, drilled that to have that. Um, and it's important, again, being supervised, that we are obviously watching him do those things, and he became very strong with that, and it helped him out doing other things. That's that's fantastic, and I think that's such a uh, an important point to, to drive home that, you know, laying that foundation, uh, especially when we're talking about high school athletes, um, to just focus on, you know, learning the, the skill and the technique of the lift before even worrying about how much – uh, you know, weight you're, you're picking up off the ground, regardless of the, the, the tool or the, the piece of equipment you're using. Right. And it's also different for each kid too, you know, on the maturity level, because you could have, you know, two kids that are both 14 and one might have the maturity of someone who's older, let's say six as a 16 year old, but then you have other 14 year olds that might have maturity of say 10 years old or 11 year old, both physical and emotional. And so that's the one thing as, as far as people who, you know, when these kids come into your gym or facility and want to train, you have to be able to kind of assess that. So someone who's more mature might be able to, even though they're the same ages, might be able to handle a more uh, structured type of training program. Whereas someone who is 14, but it has a maturity level, uh, and I'm not necessarily call them immature, but I'm just saying as far as their bodies emotionally and physically be able to handle it, might need to do more things like games, things like that to, you know, that are still physical in nature, still are going to give them some type of training effect. But at the same time, too, uh, allow them to have some fun while they do that. And that's one thing I noticed in Marcus this last year. He's gotten more interested in wanting to do uh, the training and everything else. Not something that, you know, pushed on him. Whereas Colin, uh, my oldest son, did I get his name right? Yeah. Okay, I got his name right. <laughs> um, and everything else there. Well, when you got five boys, you know, and you got two cats and, you know, all that kind of stuff and everything else, trying to remember all the names here. Um, anyways, uh, Colin got an interest in it much, much earlier. So every kid's a little bit different with that as far as when they want to do that and, you know, push Marcus, uh, with that. That's, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so, so Marcus, so what are some of the, the, you know, the, the type of program, you know, if you're going in to do a session with, with your father, um, you know, what, what are some of the lifts that you guys are doing, uh, you know, during that, that time frame? Well, right now we've like just started for the summer, so I'm starting off easy again to get back into it. And I usually start up with doing jump rope for like a minute to get my body warmed up. And then I don't know if you know, but it's, there's this thing called GPP and you do, yeah, and you do um, jumping jacks and then shuffle splits, G- burpees and mountain climbers. And you do those each for 30 seconds. I do a round of that. And then we go into kettlebell swings and snatches and then squats, deadlifts, and bench press. Awesome. That's great. That's great. And just to add to the GPP, it's more of just body weight stuff, calisthenics. Sure. You know, it's funny. When I was in grade school, we call those calisthenics. <laughs> right. Right. So just a form of GPP to kind of get his body warmed up and, and everything else with that. Uh, very easy to do. Um, you know, one thing interesting with Marcus is that uh, we use the uh, FMS in our office. We have our own uh, rehab facility there. And we have our FMS, and we have some other assessment tools we had, things like that Craig Liebenson has added uh, or used, and, and Stu McGill and a few other people. So we have kind of a, a nice assessment for him. And one thing we noticed on Marcus was that this year he really improved a lot of his uh, stability. Uh, but the one thing as far as mobility we noticed was that his uh, deep squat, if you're familiar with the FMS, mm-hmm. uh, deep squat was a one. And uh, for someone who actually has increased his sprint speed quite a bit this last year and everything else, um, it's quite uh, interesting to see that he had a one. And so one of the things we're working on today, and we were doing a little bit of also some uh, some goblet squat prying with the kettlebell and everything else. And I looked at him and I said, you know, it's interesting that your 48-year young dad is uh, being able to do this much easier than you are. So he's got some some stiff hips there that we need to address. Um, and every so often you would complain about some you know, some hip issues. I don't mean, I mean, hip issues where they're minor kind of things where as a chiropractic physician, I would go ahead and adjust and do some active release technique and things like that to help them through it. Um, but we need to address those issues. So as he goes up the chain, as far as intensity in school, meaning that now he's going to high school football, you know, where he's going to have guys that are going to be, 
you know, six feet tall, guys 200 pounds, you know, maybe or more hitting him. Uh, whereas in junior high last year, you may have had five foot six and, you know, 150, 160 pounds. Right. You know, he's going to need to have that requisite mobility to be able to, one, excel performance-wise, but decrease his injury. Uh, so we did that today as well, too. Uh, but we worked on some barbell squats, barbell deadlifts, and um, he's an amazing, uh, very good at doing pull-ups. And uh, much awesome. better than much better than his dad is. So uh, I know that uh, you and probably uh, Chief SFB Karen would appreciate, uh, you know, what Marcus is able to do in that regard. But it's uh, pretty good with that. That's awesome. What's uh, how many how many uh, reps can you can you get out? Well, if it's I don't if it's dead hang pull ups, the best I did was like six, but I was kind of tired, so I don't know currently. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of tired. I'll That's awesome. Minutes. Could have done 15, yeah. That's awesome. I've taught him to do the dead hang, you know, yeah. bar to the throat, all that kind of stuff, just like we do. Yes. Uh, at Strong First and everything else. Not the uh, the high school or the grade school pull-up where they, you know, they go down to 90 degrees of elbow bent and they go right back up. Right. Kind of, uh, so his, his pull-ups are, you know, where they, where they should be done. That's awesome. That's awesome. So for anybody in the audience that that's not familiar, we're referring to the, the – tactical pull-up uh, set up with a, the thumbless grip and you're going through a full range of motion. The arms are completely extended at the bottom. And then as you come up, you're either going to the collarbone or uh, right at the, uh, across the throat in terms of uh, where you're, where you're ending. Correct. Right. Not, not just your chin barely above the bar and that kind of stuff. Right. Right. So, Excellent. Maybe someday Marcus will be a beast tamer, you know, there you go. He might achieve that before his dad. So the, the pull ups, pull up is my nemesis. So awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so is there any uh, other before we move on to the next topic? Is there anything else you want to touch on in regards to uh, tra- training junior athletes or general recommendations for uh, the athlete or parents? Well, again, I, you know, it, it's interesting uh, to touch back when we said earlier about as far as parents getting. Uh, concerned or hearing the myths about stunning the growth. You think about this, you know, uh, Marcus's mom was raised on a farm. So up in Canada. So when you think about as far as, you know, some of the things that she had to haul around when she was eight years old, 10 years old, I mean, she was, you know, hauling things that were 30, 40 pounds worth of a bucket of something or whatever else. And so, and of course, in those situations, you're not using the best posture because you, it's, un, it's weird to kind of unwieldy to carry that thing. And sure. when you get that stuff, you know, it's not like the strict posture we have it, you know, we teach as far as in our clinic or a strong first or whatever else kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you think about that and then you actually go to a strict uh, form, people get concerned. So what I'm saying is, is, you know, parents are interested in doing that, you know, talk to a local facility or whatever else, make sure that the people have some type of certification, you know, whether it be the NSCA, CSCS or their CPT. Uh, to me, I personally feel that's the best one out there. I know there's others out there. Uh, obviously, I'm heavily involved with Strong First, and I believe very not only just from a personal level, but professional level that it offers some of the best uh, programs out there for both body weight, kettlebell, and barbell. Uh, one of the reasons I enjoyed uh, working with Pavel is because when I took my you know first kettlebell certification with him in 2006, that the attention to detail and then also the attention to technique, in addition to strength was very paramount as far as when I was there. So it was one of those things like, wow, these are people who aren't just trying to lift weight just for the sake of lifting weight, you know, um, that kind of stuff. So, again, parents, you know, check some places out. You can go to strongfirst.com, uh, you know, the NSCA. I'm sure they have as far as lists there, people who are CSCSs or CPTs in your, in your neighborhood uh, or in your city and stuff like that. Um, but find someone who's reputable, you know, and they're out there. And you just have to look for it and find it. But get someone who knows what they're doing with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Take the time and do, do the research for sure. Exactly. Great. Um, okay. So next, uh, next topic, um, we'll, we'll kind of work up what's coming down the line this summer. So we have the, you know, the Rio 2016 summer Olympic games. Um, I know you're a big, big fan of the track and field events. Oh, yeah. Um, so is there anything that one, are you, uh, particularly, uh, going to be watching, uh, for, you know, uh, in terms of the events for the Olympics that you're going to be following or, or athletes, uh, and then two, um, in terms of track and field strength training, do you have some recommendations? Well, you know, for me, as far as in track is the sprints and the throws, you know, I, I did the throws when I was in high school, back in my skinny days, uh, also did the sprints as well too. uh, coaching Marx's. 
uh, junior high team for the last uh, 16 years or so. I've been the head coach, but also coach the sprints and the relays and the, and the throws. So, uh, you know, of course, obviously in Olympics, uh, in junior high, they only do shot and disc for throws. Uh, but in the Olympics, they obviously add the hammer throw and as far as the javelin as well, too. Those are all exciting to watch. Um, it's, it's amazing to watch any athleticism of someone who is very uh, uh, astute at doing the hammer throw, for example. Watching those guys spin like that with a 16 pound shot at the end of something that's what three or four feet long wire and then throw it, you know, 270 feet is just blows my mind. Um, I'm always remember the story of, uh, Al Order, which is a, uh, I believe still our only four time, uh, gold medalist. I mean, he won gold medal in the discus four consecutive Olympics. Wow. And story of him as far as how, you know, he came into some Olympics. He wasn't in his best shape and. I think there was one Olympics that uh, he threw uh, the gold medal throw on his first throw. And I think he had broken some ribs like three or four weeks earlier or something like that. And it was just amazing the stories of that. Um, the sprints, of course, it, to me, it's just uh, I grew up, my dad used to do the sport of uh, auto sport of uh, drag racing. So to me, sprints are very much like watching drag racing when I was younger and all that stuff. That's, you know, you have a start line, that green light goes and you run as fast as possible. Or in this case, the dragsters go down the track as fast as possible to a certain end point. You know, um, Usain Bolt obviously took the uh, track and field world by storm in 2008 in Beijing um, to the point where, I mean, here's a guy who is, what, six foot four? Yep. Uh, that could run that fast. Usually guys that tall, good high jumpers, uh, maybe long jumpers, but run that fast? Usually not. Usually it's the guys that are around 5'10 to six foot one or kind of bulky and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, watching him run a 959 uh, 100 meter dash was just, just blew your mind. Um, and the fact, I think I remember hearing the stat that when he was at full speed, that his stride length was nine feet. Wow. So I'm six foot one. So think about it, you know, be laying on the track and then cutting me in half and adding that half back on top of me. And he was feet touched the ground every nine feet. I believe if I remember the story, right. When he was full speed, you know, that's so, incredible. That's yeah, incredible. It just blows your mind. And then of course the relays are another thing because, We've always at St. John's have always had a good girls and or boys four by one relay team. And to me, it's, it's about speed, but it's also about precision and attention to detail. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this year, Marsh's relay team took third in the city, but our girls team won the city championship. So every year we awesome. usually have one of the two, uh, win that. And so we take great pride as far as being able to get, as we call it, the stick, the baton around the track. And that's one of those things. So we work, you know, we work a lot on speed drills and technique drills and all that kind of stuff. But then also as far as even having a proper mental attitude uh, with all that stuff. And so Marcus was a large part of that this year and actually got fourth in the city in the 100-meter dash, too. He kind of came out of nowhere this year and got some wheels on him. <laughs> that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, he ran a personal best. I think, what, 12-4 in 100? Yeah, yeah, I got 12-4. Yeah, so he did a very good job and got second in the discus in the city. So Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, very well. But, uh, yeah, Olympics, I just love. Um, you know, to me, like I said, track and field is it. And I think, uh, you know, the IOC knows that too. I think it's one of the, some of the last things they do at the end of the, uh, end of the, uh, weekend there or the week there. So very cool. Marcus, is there uh, any events that you're going to be tuning in for, uh, during the Olympics? Um, just about the same, the 100 meter and the 200 meter. And I also really enjoy watching Javelin. I don't know why. It's just, <laughs> I just think it's really cool. I've always wanted to do it, but, our um, league or didn't have it, and I was kind of sad about that. Oh. Yeah, even I think Illinois, the state of Illinois, allows javelin at the high school level. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, Indiana does not, um, and everything else. So I don't add that here. But I think Marcus just wants to think it was an old time warrior and how he's throwing a <laughs> he's throwing a spear in battle or something like that, you know. But uh. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that's I never thought of it that way. But that's actually, I mean, yeah, it, that's. Uh, that, that imagery, that's exactly what it kind of conjures up, right? Well, you've even taken some of your, uh, you and Anthony, some of the, your older broken hockey sticks, and they'll go in the backyard and they'll throw them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, see so, how far they get. So you're getting some practice in. You might not be competing yet <laughs> at, a, at a competition, but you're, you're getting some training and practice in. I just yeah. remind him not to like throw it over the fence in the neighbor's yard and we all hurt our neighbors <laughs> over there. So that's awesome. Very cool. Um, okay. So how would you, for, for some of the events you mentioned, uh, so obviously they're, you know, on different spectrums, you, you have a hundred and 200 meter, which are, you know, get, get, uh, to the finish line as fast as possible. And then you have the javelin, um, and, and some of the other throws. So 
how would you, what were, what would be some recommendations or how would you strength train for, for those types of athletes? Do you want to talk about in season or like, uh, out of season? Well, you know what, since, since we're kind of right, uh, right before the Olympics kind of, yeah, in season and then like getting them to get ready to peak. Okay. Well, you think about in season, they've obviously done a, a requisite amount of, uh, foundation work, uh, strength work, uh, both apps worked on power prior to the season, you know, going, um, like I talk about the SFL when we spend, we spend about four hours during the SFL weekends doing programming, you know, a lot of these Olympic athletes, especially like someone like Usain Bull, who keeps repeating at the Olympics goes on a four, four year Olympic plan. But anyways, so we're talking about in season here. Um, obviously we don't want to interfere with their training. So let's say again, you talk about something like Usain Bolt or some of the throwers, um, those events, when you think of uh, sprinting and also throws require a lot of technique. You know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, like for example, sprinting, you just get on a track and run. Here's a start line. There's a finish line. Go as hard as you can. Uh, when someone, when a kid's in like second grade and are just being introduced to it, that's what you do. You don't spend a lot of time doing a lot of other stuff. But as you get kids there later in the junior high year and of course into high school, you know, we're going to do things like A skips, B skips. We're going to do high knees. We're going to do as far as, you know, butt kickers, different things like that. Um, we even have, since we don't really have in a junior high level access to a weight room for our track, uh, we even do something like frog jumps uh, for the kids to do. So they actually get some kind of full hip mobility, but also developing some power as far as like a squatting type motion uh, as they go for like, say, 10, 20 meters. Uh, so when you're doing these in-season training with these athletes, you have to make sure that the the weight training, if we're going to use that term, mm-hmm. um, is going to be complementary to what their sport-specific or SPP, uh, as we talked about as far as the GPP earlier, but SPP, uh, sport-specific training. So that when they come to, okay, so they come to their – uh, their running time. Let's say it's, you know, they're, you know, they're running so many days a week and stuff like that, that their weight training shouldn't make them so let's sore, for example, um, that they're not able to do follow through with their technique properly. So if they're supposed to, for example, when you watch, say, Usain Bolt's stride, okay, when you watch that stride, that's poetry in motion. You know, Justin Gatlin, um, uh, Tyson Gay, those guys on the U.S. team, it's poetry in motion. Now, if they do something, that is going to say make them sore with the thought process they're going to become stronger, but yet it makes them sore. They may not be able to go through their legs may not be able to go through the normal range of motion that it can because since their glutes or hamstrings or adductors are sore, they have limited range of motion. Meanwhile, their brain is still looking at that you know whatever distance they're running that they have to accomplish that. Mm-hmm. Well, now that's where sometimes injury is going to occur because their body is still saying it's like a baseball pitcher that if their hips stop rotating powerfully enough that the shoulder and or the elbow have to make up for the speed. Their, their brain still says they have to get that ball across the baseball plate. So their body will compensate wherever it needs to to be able to get that ball across. Whereas in a sprinter as well, too, they, let's say they have to run some uh, uh, repeat hundreds, okay, at 80% intensity. Well, if they're sore from that training program, the weight room, that they're thinking is trying to help them, then they may not be able to do it as well, and they may end up straining something. Maybe it's an adductor, maybe it's a hamstring, maybe it's a glute or a quad or, or a hip flexor, something like that. Now you're missing training time. So you have to make sure that that weight training is complementary. So generally with those people, you're going to see them use low volume and they're not going to be as intense. Okay. Um, I'll bring up a quick example, and this is not about track and field, but to give an example. I remember reading this many years ago, and again, I don't have the citation in front of me, but uh, I think it was University of Nebraska, and they were always very big into weight training very early on. Boyd Epley, who was the founder of the NSCA, and stuff like that helped start these guys. And I remember reading that these guys, they would test their, their strength before the season. And then they would train throughout the season. Then we test, test their strength postseason. Granted, they didn't have any injuries or whatever else. And they usually found that they very rarely had a decrease in their strength, meaning that they usually maintain 90 95% of their preseason strength, sometimes even over a hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. But they, but they would also do low volume and also low repetition. So they would still keep the intensity there, but they kept the volume low so it didn't make them sore. Because, you know, as a football player myself, I played nose tackle, defensive tackle. Whether I get into a three-point or four-point stance, I have to have, the the again, the requisite hip mobility, shoulder mobility, everything else, to be able to hold that stance. And then as soon as the ball is snapped, I go off like a rocket. But if I'm sore because I squatted heavy, let's say five sets of five, so higher volume program, three days earlier, Now I'm going to possibly strain something or I'm not going to be as powerful. So again, those people there, when they're in season track and field, 
They have to do things that are complementary. So one, they keep, keep their performance up there or increase it, but also decrease the injury. Um, so again, you're going to do, you know, maybe two or three sets of doubles, maybe two or three sets of triples, whatever weight it is, maybe say 70 to 80% of their weight. You know, every so often, depending upon where you are. Now, football is different because you have a game every Saturday, let's say, in college football. Whereas track and field, you know, you don't have a meet. You might have a meet four months from now. You might have a meet three months from now. So that's where you're going to have to use a little bit more difference as far as uh, planning that program. You know, I always like to say plan to work, work to plan as far as when I teach the SFL. Because you got to plan to work and then work it. Um, but then also each athlete's going to be a little different. But still, as you get closer, you have to reduce that volume, reduce the sets and reps so you don't have any injuries uh, with those people. No, I, I think that's I think that's great. And one of the points you made there that that I think is really powerful is as you talked about, you know, doing instead of doing sets of you know five by five, for example, they're going to be doing uh, you know sets of lower reps. You know, just maybe some doubles. Could you just sort of just you know broadly explain why it's okay to be doing sets that are you know, l- lower rep in, in nature. And that's not something that, you know, you don't need to get a, caught up in how many reps you're doing per, per training session and you can still get benefits from it. Now again, you're talking about the in season as far as that. Sure. Because I, because I, I feel, uh, as though, you know, for, for those in the audience that, that might not have, um, you know, the strength training background, it, it seems, um, and I've had conversations with, with people uh, in the endurance community that, that feel they need to get a lot of repetitions in, in terms of strength training to have a benefit or carry over um, and do a, you know, high repetitions, a lot of sets. Um, you know, I was, I was hoping that you could kind of shed some light on why you could do, you know, less reps and still get a lot of carry over and benefit from it. Well, let's, let's take uh, marathon runners, for example. Or sure. Just- 5k 10k that kind of stuff you know when you think about someone like that um any body weight that they put on due to say increase in hypertrophy or muscle mass is more weight that they have to carry when they run right you know i had this joke i'm I'm a big uh, tour de france fan um you know it's kind of funny i weigh 280 pounds or whatever else but i used to race bikes back when i was uh, in high school and stuff and um so when those guys i mean they have to even have a minimum weight to their bikes and they try to shell those things down as skinny as possible. So when they're climbing Alpe d'Huez or they, you know, as far as the Alps or whatever else, the Pyrenees, it's light. So even if their bike's too light, they got to put washers or whatever else on their bike. Same thing with a marathon runner. If they put on a lot of muscle mass and I'm saying I'm training them, they're going to be upset because they just gained five pounds and now they got to carry over 26.2 miles. Right. So one of the things that's nice about as far as lower rep programs, okay, is that you can still get, you know, as far as stimulate the muscle, still increase, you know, increase their connective tissue strength. So we're talking the joint ligaments, we're talking the tendons, we're talking the muscles, all that kind of stuff around the area there. Because you got to think about this too, when those marathon runners, every time that foot hits the ground, you know, there's different research that shows, but you're talking around seven to nine times their body weight of force is being pushed up that leg up through the body. So if those tendons are not very strong, you're going to have things, you know, patellar tendonitis, you're going to have Achilles tendonitis, you're going to have all these different types of issues, plantar fasciitis or whatever else that are going to be going on. Um, so again, regardless, again, even if we're a sprinter too, doing lower reps, lower as far as, you know, lower volumes like that can be very beneficial. Uh, there's a study done a few years ago, and again, I don't have a citation in front of me, but it was talking about how they had uh, distance runners do a low volume, uh, low rep program, and they're actually able to increase as far as, I should say, decrease uh, their time in the marathon, which is weird because it's almost like back in the old days where baseball pitchers were not allowed to weight train. I mean, it was just like, you know, it was just like, you know, don't even look at the weight. (laughs) The third baseman could do it. The slugger could do it. Designated hitter, but the pitcher, uh uh-uh, because it would throw off your timing. Well, then comes around as far as, you know, uh, Roger Clemens, you have uh, Nolan Ryan, all these guys that had very rigorous off-season training programs. Reason why Nolan Ryan threw for what twenty plus years without any major really injuries, and he still throws throws throwing heaters, you know, ninety miles an hour, ninety five miles an hour, that kind of stuff. So he kind of debunks some of that aspect. Now you got pitchers all over the place that are training weight training, uh, but because of the, the stresses on the body. So again, doing low rep, low volume type things with a little heavier weight can be beneficial. Think about this too. At the end of a marathon, you know, say you're at mile 25, you still got 1.2 miles left to go. That's when you start, you know, looking around, you see where your, your competitors are and you say, okay, I got to kick up the speed a little bit. 
So doing also some of that weight training is going to allow your body to be able to generate, to have, you know, rate force development as far as that leg hitting the ground. And so when that leg hits the ground, they're able to actually sprint. Whereas sometimes marathoners at the end of that, those 25 miles with 1.2 left to go, they literally are exhausted. They can't, they can't call upon their nervous system to say, Hey, let's get those motor units on, on line here. We got to start sprinting a little bit heavier here. You might find that with your rowers as well, too. You know, yep. what, you know, what is the longest, what is the longest distance you rowers as far as, you know, actually you know, compete at? So the Olympic distance is 2000 meters, which is a mile and a quarter. Okay. Um, but it, collegiate or, uh, some universities will do, um, head races in the fall season, uh, to prep for the, the main season in the spring. And those will typically be anywhere from, you know, four to 6,000 meters in length. Oh, um, gee. yeah. So about three, 3.2 miles. So depending on the conditions and, uh, you know, wind, as well as, uh, if the, the water has current or not, you're looking at a race that can be, you know, anywhere from, you know, 13 to 18 minutes. And again, depending on the boat class too. So you have a men's eight, a women's eight, all the way down to a men's and women's single and everything in between. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of variables in play there that affect the, 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 um, the, the final time. Do you have a men's, like a men's single, he could row 2000 meters. Correct. So you think about that, that he's, you know, obviously he has a certain, I assume, kind of constant speed. He gets up to a certain velocity. He maintains that. Mm-hmm. So at that point, his acceleration is, you know, basically zero because he's maintaining that velocity. But then as he gets closer to the line, just like anyone else, he's got to kick it up. And that ability to go from zero acceleration to increase the acceleration. Sorry, I was an engineer before I became a doctor. So I love physics as well, too. Um, get that increase that acceleration. He's got to call upon his central nervous system to generate that power. Right. And that's where sometimes some of these, again, lower rev, low volume, uh, a higher intensity as far as weight training can actually benefit those people as well, too. Especially that's in season, obviously. Right, right. No, that's great. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I love that. I think that's multiple points that you covered that that show a ton of benefits across multiple sports. Um so so Marcus, is there um is there any type of, you know, routine that you like to do uh in season uh kind of prep maybe a day or two before the competition, uh either mentally or physically that you like to follow? Um actually there really isn't anything that I do before games, I guess. I well, mentally, I usually just, like, before games, I listen to music to, like, get me, like, hyped up for the game and get my head into it and get serious about it. Because when I was younger, I used to not be competitive at sports, like, at all. And, like, I'd be that kid that if we lost, I'd be like, hey, guys, I got to play with my friends, so that that's all that matters. But now, like, I'm actually angry if we lose, and I'm like, we need to win the next one, so... But he's also reminded by his father that, again, to be humble and modest, and the same thing, too, right, Mars? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true competitor. That's right. You want that's to right. Win. That's right. Well, I, you know, I, obviously I don't like to lose either or stuff like that too, but you know, if you give your hundred yes. percent, you know, and you still lose, then, you know, what more can you do? But obviously he plays pretty much all team sports. So it's a, it's a combined effort of all the kids involved there as well too. But, uh, he, there's sometimes depending on what's going on with him, I might recommend certain, some mobility things or some stretches for him to do prior. But, uh, right now it's, uh, Listening to that uh, goofy music he listens to, you know, not the not the pro- the appropriate heavy metal stuff that I listen to, you know. But, oh, nice. What do you, what do you, Doc? What, what do you uh, what do you like? Well, when I'm getting ready, when I'm lifting or whatever else, you know, it's the Metallica, you know, ACDC, you know, Rob Zombie, Five Finger Death Punch, you know, bands like that, um, and everything else. It's, it's funny though. There was one time I we trained hard at the gym, and I went home. I threw Beethoven on the on the CD player. And my kids thought I lost my marbles. And <laughs> I said to him, I said, listen, I just got done training hard for two hours. My brain is just like, and it was a hard training session. Right. And uh, so I threw it on there almost more as a kind of a start the emotional relaxation and mental relaxation and stuff like that. In addition to other things you do during the day. So I already had that, that high intensity stuff. I needed to bring myself down. So, uh, and every year I bring the kids to like our Christmas pops in town, which has, you know, the uh, Christmas music and the orchestra in town here and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that about me. They think I'm just a Metallica, you know, metalhead and that's about it, you know. That's awesome though. That's, uh, it sounds a little bit like you're, you're, um, kind of utilizing the, the Mozart effect. Exactly. Very cool. Very, Very cool. Good. Exactly. 
Um, excellent. Um, okay. So shifting, shifting gears again. Um, so here's a, here's a fun question for you. So how would you prep for the, uh, snatch test if you had been primarily barbell training? And so for, for anybody in the audience that's listening, that's not familiar, the, the snatch test is a five minute test where you have to, uh, complete a hundred repetitions, um, in under five minutes with for men, for men with a 53 pound or 24 kilogram kettlebell and then women with a 16 kilogram or 35 pound kettlebell. Right. So again, primarily the barbell program in the background, you said? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, first off, you know, one of the things that I always would make sure with someone like that who's interested in going to, let's say, uh, uh, SFG level one, which is the kettlebell level one, sir, which is, you know, one of the testing things you have there. Um, first off, obviously making sure that their kettlebell swing is spot on. Because as you, as you know, that the, uh, the kettlebell snatch, which is a one handed snatch with the kettlebell, um, you know, half of it's the swing. And so if your swing is not very good technique or form, you have no business doing a kettlebell snatch. So obviously we would dial that in and make sure that that was on that as well too. And we would probably, you know, get them over a period of time over a couple of months, you know, performing, you know, a few thousand swings to kind of get their bodies ready. You know, we would start off with two hand swings where both hands are on the kettlebell and then we would eventually migrate to the one hand swing. Uh, which is obviously, you know, again, if you think of the kettlebell snatch, the bottom half of the, uh, or whatever you want. So the beginning of the uh, kettlebell snatch is a one handed swing. Mm-hmm. So we make sure that that's dialed in and everything else there. Once we get that dialed in and everything else, we would then start showing the technique of the snatch. And then a lot of it has to do with timing. Um, there's two different ways as far as that people usually take, do the snatch test is that they'll either just do all hundred reps and switch, you know, switch every 10, 20 reps or whatever else hand to hand and get it all done. Um, or there's another way that I prefer to do it, and I started did this many years ago, was I basically turned into powerlifting the uh, thought process and, and created five sets of 20, where I would do 10 left, 10 right. I would set it down. Um, I had a friend of, uh, actually senior SFG, and, uh, Andrea Chang, uh, timing me, and she would tell me what the, how many seconds was in the minute that I set it down. She would give me five seconds lead in, and at the top of the minute, I would then do start the next set. And I'd do 10, 10, set it down. And I had it down timed down to a point where, um, about 20 reps usually took me about 40 to 41 seconds. And, and so, so you, so you had, had about 20, 18 to 20 seconds of rest. Correct. And everything else there. And I remember when I did that for the first time, uh, former master, uh, Mark Rifkin said, that was awesome. And, uh, he liked seeing it as far as, cause I couldn't put a little powerlifting, uh, you know, leaning on, on top of the snatch test. I had no desire to go all out for what five, you know, for hundred reps and not set it down to me. I was like, no, you know, <laughs> Um, and I told Pablo many years ago that the snatch test was 97 reps too many. <laughs> of course, he did not agree with me. He would just say, you know, doc, just do the snatch test, you know, and everything else there. But, uh, anyway, so yeah, that's the way I, I do like to do it and everything else. And it actually worked well. Cause I remember after I set it, uh, the bell down after the fourth round, which is I've completed 80 reps. Some people were going, what are you doing? What are you doing? You only got like a minute and 20 minutes, 20 seconds right, left. Right, and right, right, right. just work the program again, plan the work, work the plan. And I started at the top of the minute, got done at 441 and I was right on time. So it was one of those things that you, you have to have some attention to detail also too, and put a plan and attack, you know, with that. Mm-hmm. And with that, my time of rest when I got done with that, you know, with a hundred reps was 19 seconds before the minute was exactly the same amount of time throughout the whole thing. So it wasn't like I had a, a, I started to degenerate in form or in time. Uh, so again, working on, you know, a few thousand swings, getting that work together. Um, then also too is working on the, uh, snatch technique. Um, one thing we did as far as, uh, with my fiance, Leslie, as she got ready for her level one, uh, one program that I put together for her was that she would do a, uh, a cumulative 120 swings and snatches. And what she did is that she would actually do, um, uh, one handed swings, 10 left, 10 right, set it down. Okay. 15 seconds rest, 10 snatches left and right, set it down and then repeat that three times. So in a sense, she did six rounds, so to speak. Three of the rounds were just one hand swings, 10 each side. Mm-hmm. Three of the rounds were, you know, so, or as far as the snatches. And then as we got closer and closer, we started replacing those swing sets with snatches. And then we'd also start to reduce some of her, uh, her rest time. We found with her, it took her about 44 seconds or so to do her 40 or I'm sorry, 20 reps, 10 right, 10 left. You know, so she had about a 15, 16 minute window as far as, sorry, minute, <laughs> 15, 16 second window <laughs> of, rest. uh, yeah, that's good rest <laughs> of, uh, of rest time there between the sets. And the last two search, she just got her level two. 
uh, worked like a charm. Never felt exhausted, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, regarding the snatch test, too, especially if you come from a barbell background to a kettlebell background like I did, is that, you know, two things to think about is that, one, realize that the rest times between sets, whatever you're doing, is going to be less. Mm-hmm. So, for example, when I was powerlifting and, and say, I did a heavy set of five back, back squats, I might take uh, five, six minutes rest. I don't know if you saw the article I wrote for the Strong First blog called 300 Seconds. I did. Yeah, and that was addressing that issue that a lot of people in the kettlebell world that want to look into more, you know, as far as heavy uh, strength training, you got to realize you're going to have to stretch out that rest time if you want to have quality and quantity um, and everything else there. So you, you're going backwards. You're saying, okay, I mean, thinking about that, you're only going to get 15 seconds rest <laughs> after doing 20 reps and then go do another 20 reps to a barbell person and say, you're nuts. Uh, because they're used to taking that type of rest time between their work sets. Sure. Uh, so there's that aspect. The other thing, too, is that, like, for, again, back to Leslie, when she did her first uh, kettlebell certification, was when you start to go from the aerobic aspect to the anaerobic aspect, where you're actually going down to oxygen debt. Um, and not that she felt this, but it's one of those things you have to understand, you're not going to die. <laughs> you will live. <laughs> Right. It's, a, it's a finite time, a finite reps. You will not do because and you have to almost, um, it's a phrase I remember reading about from the Navy SEALs, embrace the suck, you know, where you have to understand that, you know, that it's for some people, especially in the beginning of training, from going from a barbell to a kettlebell world and learning that snatch test, there's going to be some suck there. You're going to, you're, it's not going to be fun. Yep. But the more you try to avoid it, the harder it's going to be. The more you understand it's going to happen and I'm going to live and I'll still have dinner tonight, go see a movie and all that stuff, that things are going to be okay. You can actually accomplish it and mentally wrap your head around it a little bit better. Absolutely. Absolutely. When, when I was pre- preparing last summer for the, the level one, um, you know, it had been a, it had been a while since I had done some, some racing and rowing. And so I had was doing, you know, some practice snatch tests once a month, uh, a couple of months out. Um, and it was the closest I, I felt the experience was to doing a 2k in rowing because it's, you, you're, you're at, the, it's like, you know, it's like watching track and field, uh, in, in some ways, because you're at the, the start line, you're, everybody's at a dead stop and they drop, you know, or count down and drop the flag and, and you're going and it's first one to the finish line wins, but you're going flat out and you're getting yourself up to speed or in this case, the boat up the speed as quickly as possible and trying to maintain that speed across a mile and a quarter. And, yeah. you know, you get six, 700 meters in and your, your lungs are burning and, and your, your legs are on fire and everything. And it's very, very similar to the feeling that you get when you get about, you know, two to three minutes into the snatch test. Right. And one thing we did, with, one thing we did with Leslie, which helped her out because she has really long arms so as Master SFG Fabio Zonin said when he was testing her one year, he says, I can't believe how high that kettlebell is above the ground when she's finishing her snatch. Um, but the point is, is that with her, you know, coming from a powerlifting background did help with the snatch test because for me, you know, uh, with my body weight and strength, 53 pounds is nothing. Right. And I don't mean to sound egotistical when I say that, but even percentage-wise, hey, don't look at me like that. Right? <laughs> uh, percentage-wise, it's not a large percentage of my body weight. Right. You know, it's just, it's just actually just a conditioning aspect of doing that. Um, but for her, the 35 pound kettlebell is a larger percentage of her body weight. So what we did with her was we actually created some heavy, light, medium snatch test, uh, sessions. So with her, she would like, for example, on her heavy one, she would be the, uh, rounds that she was swinging, the one hand swing. We had her swinging the 20. Okay. So she's actually doing heavier weight with that. And then working on trying to keep the timing the same as when she would swing a 16. So she really had to explosively, as far as, you know, uh, get to the top of the swing, get that bell to float. As Pavel says, that's your rest time. Okay. Um, and everything else are two. On her, and then she would also, that those days, she would swing a 20, snatch a 16. On her medium days, she would swing a 16, but snatch the 14. Okay. And then, and then on her okay. light days, she would swing the still, she would swing the 14 and then snatch the 12. Now, those days, uh, sometimes we would actually work up to four rounds of what I said earlier. So she would actually do uh, 160 reps total because she was doing lighter weight. But what I was getting, trying to get her to do was also try to increase the speed of the bell. Right. So when, when she was at the top of the snatch, to get her to actually pull the bell down 
uh, faster, get used to instead of just letting gravity bring the bell down to actually work on pulling it. And then actually we saw some carryover to on her day when she was doing the 20 and the 16 as far as a heavy snatch day. So when she came time to doing her, you know, snatch test at the level one and level two, you know, there were not any, any hard for her at all. I mean, she was very used to doing that. Um, and one thing I also give advice on a snatch test too, one, remember that it's only five minutes right. and there's 1,440 minutes in a day. So five minutes out of, out of that one day, you know, and maybe in every two year period is not exactly a lot to get, you know, give out of testing. Of course, you're practicing. Um, second, don't practice a snatch test like 18 times every week. Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Okay. You get to the point where your OCD starts to take over. And I know enough people that have done so much practice with a snatch test. They've actually caused injury, whether it be obviously blowing their hands out as far as the skin, um, you know, sacroiliac issues, lower back, shoulders, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, every so often do it. Um, one thing I sometimes I tell people to do is you really want to practice your timing. Do a three minute snatch test. Do a two minute snatch test, two and a half minutes. Do some kind of a timing where you can still kind of work on your timing aspect, but not do the full 100 reps. Right. You know, right. Like I teach the SFL. I've never, ever, even in my powerlifting career, ever maxed out in the gym. Ever. It's always been done at a powerlifting meet. So you, so you save it for, for the competition. Exactly. Now, it doesn't mean you can't actually do a five minute snatch test just so you can test it. But again, especially as you get closer to the, uh, you know, le- level one, if that's your goal to do the snatch test or whatever else, um, don't again increase it. You want to more decrease how often you practice it as far as the test itself. Sure. Um, but we see that a lot with mistakes people make when they come into them. Awesome. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Um, Marcus, you got anything that, to add? I know you, uh, you mentioned earlier that you, you do some swings and snatches. Um, nope. No. <laughs> he, he does like to show his abs off quite a bit. There you oh. go. All right. There you go. All right. But of course, he's he's wearing that uh, that flash uh, shirt today, which is of course got the abs pre printed on the front of the shirt there. So you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, Marcus comes from a very uh, northern European t- European heritage, so his skin is very white like his dad. So we don't take the shirts off too often. We blind people with that, you know. <laughs> very pale. Very pale. Indeed. That's right. Lots of freckles and very pale. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you on there. I'm up in the northeast, so it's uh, it's it's we don't get much sunshine. It's a lot of gray. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, uh, building upon that question, so how um, what what are some some recommendations to integrate kettlebell lifts with barbell lifts in a program? If you want to do, you know, say a, a four week cycle. Um, you know, how would you structure that across, across a week? Well, usually like, for example, um, what I do, let's just say we're getting, um, ready for a football season for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I need to have some, uh, some strength. And one of the things I always bring up as an example, and those who have attended the SFL have heard this already, but as a nose tackle, defensive tackle, a lot of times because of my size, I'll get double teamed. So I'll have two offensive linemen, whether it be center guard, guard tackle, whatever else, that will come at me. And like I like to say is, you know, pitcher 600 pounds of man meat trying to trying to, <laughs> trying to manipulate me and push me around. Right. So I weigh 280 pounds. So I'm, I need to have both the lower body strength and also the upper body strength to withstand that. And on a double team, you know, as a football coach as well, our double team, First off, you don't want your defensive lineman to lose ground because that means the offensive linemen have done their job to get out of the way for a running back to come behind them or whatever else. Sure. Um, or and or be able to split the double team and be able to get into the backfield and possibly stop the running back or whatever. So what that means is that I have to have some strength, which means I need to use the barbell. Um, if you think about, like, for example, the kettlebells, you know, they do make 60-kilo kettlebells nowadays, um, even the double 48s, which are, of course, the beasts and everything else. If I were to do a double uh, beast kettlebell front squat, you know, that's 212 pounds. So for someone re- with requirements that I have, you know, first off, you got to be able to clean those things and put them in a the rack position. That's kind of uh, obviously difficult for some people. But just the weight itself, it's not enough weight to really get me as far as strong to what I need to be able to do. So I need to have to use a barbell to be able to put more plates in the bar and stuff like that. Sure. Now, being as that said, I still then have to have the conditioning that the average football play is about 10 seconds usually about 10 seconds on and about 50 seconds off, okay, between plays. 
So I have to have a you know one to five work ratio aspect and being able to do that. So I also have to develop the conditioning. And that's what was tough for me going from straight powerlifting to football was that <laughs> the coach of my very first semi-pro team joked, he goes, man, you hit that guy with that ball snapped, you hit that guy like a ton of bricks. But then you stop because I wasn't used to moving my feet because, you know, as Marcus has found out, you know, with the back squat or the deadlift, you know, once you're set, your feet don't move. Right. You know, right. it's the rest of your body that moves, obviously, through the range of motion, whether it be the deadlift or the squat. And obviously, if your feet are moving during the squat in a heavy squat, that's not a good thing, obviously, uh, and everything else there. Exactly. You're all over the place. So again, I would, didn't have that, I didn't have that neuromuscular pattern really developed inside my body. So that first off season after my first season, I had to learn, I, I had to, <laughs> I had to go through the grieving process, you know, that 12 step process. <laughs> I, had, I had to almost like have a little funeral for my absolute strength. Um, because I still was, even though I knew I was playing football, I knew that my best squad of 705 was not going to happen anymore. If I was going to be able to do well at football, I still had to have a strong squat. But I couldn't, I had, could not train like that. Cause like I said earlier, then some of the mobility issues would come into play as far as I'm too sore or whatever else. So I had to learn how to move my feet better. And I also had to, and of course I kind of relied back on my, uh, track and field coaching that I told coach the kids, just basically applied it to myself and be able to, so I had to still keep some strength, but I had to work a lot more on strength and endurance. And that's where the kettlebells come in. So I've been able to use the kettlebells and barbells together. So to kind of piece together a, a typical training day for me for football sure, um, would basically be, okay, I would I'd get up, uh, we'd uh, go to the, the Lures or Bishop Lures, which is the high school that Marsh is going to, the track there. Uh, we would actually do some, uh, as far as some uh, mobility stuff, uh, we'd actually do uh, do our sprint work, okay? Some of that will also include some grass drills where I'd put my football cleats on and we would do certain uh, cone drills, things like that on the grass to be able to get the mobility and, you know, it's a certain feel as far as what, just like you're in know, rowing, you have to be able to understand as far as getting the seat with that. Um, then usually what we do is we go back, we drive over to my facility, which is about a 10, 15 minute drive. So that's kind of my rest time. And then I would go in. So there's some conditioning there because part of the grass drills and part of those things, there's a certain amount of rest time between, because obviously, like I said, you get that one to five work ratio with football, uh, and everything else there. So I would have, get that done first. Then I would go into the gym and I would actually then get the barbell. Now, one thing I've always done since I became an RKC and then of course on the strong first down the road, um, with uh, as far as Pavel, that I always have kept my, uh, <laughs> my ability to snatch the kettlebell, uh, present, uh, and everything else. You never know when, uh, it might be with Pavel and says, doc, let's do the snatch test. Right. So right. Prepared. So one of the things I always do, I'll do a certain swing, uh, swing snatch, uh, ladder program for, you know, three, four minutes prior to <clears> doing <throat> as far as a barbell back squat or the deadlift. Uh, then I would move into those movements there. Um, I use the get up quite a bit, especially when I'm doing, uh, upper body moves, like as far as the standing military press and or, uh, bench press. And meaning I would do those movements first and then I would do the get up near the end as far as both a, um, everything from shoulder mobility to as far as strengthening the core to, um, you know, basically getting the nervous system turned back on, especially when it's on weeks between games and stuff like that. Um, as a the lineman, your shoulders take a beating. So I want to make sure the shoulders stay good. Kettlebell arm bar is a big staple. That and the, as far as the bent arm bar, um, uh, are very big staples as far as my program with that. Um, and then also to windmill. I love doing the windmills. They do fantastic for not only as far as strengthening the core, but also it actually seems to loosen up my hips after doing squats and deadlifts. Um, so, uh, another favorite move of mine is the, uh, kettlebell renegade row. Yes. We don't really teach that as far as a strong first, but you know, that's a great move. Um, it's hard to do, especially if your goal is to, uh, like I always tell people, try not to wave that flag. I mean, if you had a flag attached to your right. back that you weren't waving that, and it's a very hard move with that. Uh, senior SFG Brad Nelson taught me that one and it uh, has worked wonders. If you, you like that one too, Marcus? Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. So those are some things I do with that. Um, but yeah, just the swings and snatches and get ups and, you know, the windmill, the arm bar, and I just kind of, I pepper them in within, within the barbell program there, uh, which is interesting because I stopped powerlifting in 2005 and then started even learning kettlebells in 2006. So I've actually never have actually competed in powerlifting with using the benefits of the kettlebell. So at some point, some point when I retire from football, then I will go back to doing competing in powerlifting. So I'm kind of curious to see again how 
competitively, that adds in other people like uh, Donnie Thompson and some other big time powerlifters that used it, and, and Pavel's talked about it as well too mm-hmm. uh, that they've had good success with that uh, and everything else there too. So I'll, I'll be interested to see what that's like the years down the road. Awesome, fantastic, fantastic. Um, okay, do you have a, a preferred warm up before you're you're going into a barbell session? Um, you know, something that's sort of like a bread and butter thing that you like to do. Well, as you know, as, as we, <laughs> as you see, hear a lot on the, uh, the, uh, college known as Facebook, uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of people always seem to kind of like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Again, the warm up is to get your central nervous system, you know, ready for what the task at hand is. Right. Uh, I was like that. So like in Marcus's case, like he talked about earlier where we had him do some jump rope, uh, we had him do some of the uh, body weight calisthenics. You know, we call we just call it GPP, but you know that's kind of what it is there. Um, I also had him do some uh, some mild stretching and everything else with that. Um, yeah, anything else I missed, Mars? No, that's no. it. Um, and stuff like that. For me, I would do some other things. I would um, because of the sprint training like that. I do these uh, movements called foot drills, which are some mm-hmm. things that um, help some mobility in your ankles because of all the pounding that I'm doing. Um, I also do the jump rope as well too. Um, I would also uh, do, um, Craig Levinson showed me many years ago, um, this thing called, uh, well, but now I come with cat camel as far as some mobility, as far as the backs, so a little bit of yoga there. Um, and then also some, uh, supine and sideline twists as far as the spine and everything else with that it works really helps you as he calls it spinal flossing. Um, uh, so it works well with that. And then of course, a lot of times I'll use the arm bar, um, and, or that I may even as a squat day or deadlift day, I may do the, uh, Cossack, uh, squat. Uh, a lot of people right. sometimes do that with the, uh, as a strength move, I just usually hold a 18 kilo, I'm sorry, 18 pound or 12 kilo kettlebell. And I'll just work that side to side to really kind of open up the hips some more. And then again, if a squat day, I might do the goblet prime. Like today I was interested with Marcus. We were kind of, um, uh, doing some, uh, kind of bootstrapping a goblet prime where, uh, we would go down into the, the, uh, bottom of the squat, work with the kettlebell, uh, do some hip prime with that. And then we would put the bell on the ground and then we keep our fingers on the ground and basically stand up and straighten out our legs. In a sense, kind of a hamstring posterior chain stretch. Sure. And everything. Uh, so we're doing that today to help out a little bit. So it just kind of depends as far as what the workout might be. If it's a, if it's a bench workout or I'm standing military press, I may not do the goblet prying that day. Uh, may spend a little bit more time doing the kettlebell arm bar, uh, work on that kind of thing. So it just depends. Um, and being a, you know, practicing doctor of chiropractic and leaning over patients all day. So I want to make sure that my thoracic, uh, mobility is also present as well, too, in addition to hip stuff. Sure. No, I, I, I love that how you, 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 uh, you adjust what you're going to do in your warm up for, for the, you know, sort of the, the targeted lifts for that day. Um, you know, for, like you said, for example, if you're going to be going overhead, you're going to make sure to emphasize, you know, the sh- shoulder girdle and thoracic mobility a little bit more versus if you're doing deadlift or, or squat, you're going to focus more on the hips. Right. right. That's great. Good. Awesome. Um, okay. So move into the, the next topic. Um, let me kind of save this one for last. So talking about the SFL. So for, for the audience who's not familiar with it, what is the SFL and then how does that fit within the, the strong first system? Uh, it's one of three disciplines that we teach across the, the curriculum. Right. The, uh, you know, strong first is obviously the, if you look at the name strong first, um, and that's one of this. It's, it's a, it's a, when Pablo came up with that name and, and I even came up with the logo, uh, it was very interesting. And, you know, you can think about it because one of the things, for example, one of the main reasons that a lot of people go into nursing homes or assisted living is because they lack the strength to do daily activities that they normally could. They can't shovel the driveway anywhere. They can't mow the grass. They can't, um, you know, pick up their laundry, whatever else. Can't even make it up a, t- a stairs. And, uh, so strong first is that, and, and sometimes it gets misinterpreted, you know, strong first is that strength is everything. Obviously you need conditioning and all that kind of stuff there too. But again, you have to have basic strength to be able to do anything in life, whether it be just to run, whether it be to ride a bike, uh, to row, you know, to, to do anything. Uh, so a strong first there. And then obviously, you know, Pavel was one of the kind of credited to bringing the kettlebell to the United States. Obviously I think it's been here before that, but as far as popularize it with everyone, um, and then with that, we kind of have added the continuum of body weight where there's no equipment needed, maybe a pull up bar or something like that. You've been through the body weight cert yourself. I have. Yes. Yeah. You know, so you know what I'm talking about. And then also too, the other end of the continuum, the barbell where you can 
almost be allowed infinite amount of weight uh, on the same you know seven foot steel bar uh, that you're using there. So with all that, uh, we created the SFL part of it um, and started you know working on. It. So what we teach at the SFL, we teach as far as the uh, the front squat, we teach the zercher squat, uh, we teach as far as the back squat. So again, there's three squats right there. We got the good morning, we got the bench press, okay, standing military press, and of course the deadlift. And we teach both the uh, sumo style deadlift, which is where your hands are inside your legs when you're starting to lift, and then the conventional style where your hands are outside your legs. And uh, we go through that. And then also that weekend, we also cover four hours of programming where we cover a lot of the basics of programming, some of the nuances of it and everything else. Um, there's obviously where you have uh, Pavel's put together the plan strong pro- programming as far as a uh, workshop that he does and everything. Um, but this just talks a lot about, you know, as far as the programs, we spend more time teaching people how to do that. Uh, Marcus got a good chance to see that a couple of years ago. We had uh, the SFL London. And uh, so I brought him over there with me. And uh, he got to see a lot of what uh, what his dad does and everything. And and what did you accomplish while you were over there? I did a lot of sleeping. No, what else did you accomplish? <laughs> oh, I climbed the rope. <laughs> nice, nice. Cute little, cute little, uh, you know, diversion here a little bit. There was a rope in the gym there that they had there, and uh, right away, just like any other kid, like a monkey, you know, wants to climb it. And uh, he only got so far the first day. And one of the guys attending the certification. Um, was, uh, I think equivalent to like what we call, uh, 101st Airborne. You know, he was, uh, as far as in the British military there. So he showed Marcus how to climb the rope. And every day we were there, Marcus kept getting a little higher, a little higher. And then when the certification was finally over at the end, what did you do? I climbed to the top of the rope. He climbed to the top of the rope. That's, <laughs> That's right. Awesome. And the whole crowd, everyone was very excited for him there. Um, but yeah, we spent a lot of time teaching. You know, one of the things that we talk about in the SFL is technique, technique, technique. And uh, I'm not sure if it's a good nickname or not, but some people have called me Dr. Setup uh, because we would spend a lot of time working on the setup. And, um, you know, from the one arm, one leg push up you know, as far as tests, as far as body weight, that a lot of that getting being able to do that is set up. Yes. And if your setup isn't proper and everything's dialed in, you're not going to nail it. Yep. You know, yep. And then the balancing act with that. Um, so again, anyways, with, with that, we spent a lot of time working on the setup and we actually get to the lifting there. Um, but we're able to teach a lot of people proper form and technique that again, like I said earlier, increases your performance and decrease your chance of injury. Um, and, and of course, you know, for a lot of people, we're able to debunk some myths, um, uh, remove some things that they may have done before or heard this is okay. That's not okay. Whatever else kind of thing. And we're able to do it properly and, uh, being able to have them leave there with a lot of knowledge of how to actually use the barbell in a positive way, especially for those who come with only body weight or kettlebell knowledge. Right. Right. No, I'm definitely looking forward to, to attending one in the future. I, I, uh, you know, planning on, on doing all of them, uh, at some point, but as you know, it, there's so much, uh, knowledge and information to absorb at the certification, uh, that it's, it's important to kind of space them out to make sure you're, you're, you know, taking the time to, implement and practice what you've learned. Um, because there's a lot there. It's very, it's, it's very high quality. It's very dense. So it's like, right. you just reread the manual over and over and, and, and work. There's so many nuances and subtleties to work on across all three. Well, it's interesting too, because when you've had someone who's comes to the SFL and this is for me, and it may be the same for Karen, if someone has has already done the SFL and the SFG and come to the body weight. But when I've had people have done body weight and SFG and they come to the SFL, they're saying, obviously it's a different uh, medium because you're using a barbell instead of a kettlebell or body weight. But again, strong first tends to keep all the principles very similar to it um, and everything else there. Uh, one quick, one quick thing to add to that too, is like, for example, in the body weight, you guys are taught the pistol. Correct. Yep. Okay. But it's interesting because I always get the question from some, you know, I always tell someone who's been to the body weight when they say, well, you, you treat the spine like a, a cylinder where meaning that from the neck down to the tailbone, we don't want any hinging or, or motion of the spine while you're doing barbell. Okay. We want it coming from the hip joint, uh, whether it be a squat or a deadlift or whatever else. Whereas in the pistol, you're going to have some spinal flexion for some people doing that. And I remind him that one of the things is, is that in the body weight, whether you're doing it with just pure body weight or you have a, you know, a 24 kilo counterbalance kettlebell, it's in front of you. 
And not only that, but during the motion, usually the deflection doesn't usually change during the motion. Now, you go ahead and load 300 pounds on your back of the barbell, you don't want any spinal flexion. You know, you want to have a, a nice neutral spine that's held in a rigid area through the uh, intra-abdominal pressure, you know, all that stuff, embracing the spine there. And, do that. and of course, you know, Stu McGill in his podcast with you mentioned that as well, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everything else there that you want to obviously keep it. So there's a little difference in that respect, but it's interesting how people always ask that question when we do that. But again, we're trying to keep the body healthy and keep it strong and strong first. Awesome. Awesome. I love it, Doc. I love it, Doc. Marcus, anything to add? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, um, no. 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 All right. <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to touch on uh, before we move into the rapid fire? <laughs> rapid fire. Bang, bang. There you go. Um, let's see. No, I, w- I would just, again, we, if you're going to, you know, learn these things, you know, don't be afraid to pay someone to do it. Um, you know, as a, as a chiropractic physician from that angle, you know, there's many times people go into gyms you know, whether they've read uh, Muscle and Fitness, and I don't even know that magazine's still around, uh, Men's Health or whatever else, and see things in there, and they go to attempt it themselves. Uh, there's many times over the 22 years I've been a doctor that I've had to fix problems because people tried to emulate that. And, yes, you can learn a lot from YouTube University or the College of Facebook or whatever else, um, but it, it, it's, it'll, be, it'll be money well spent uh, working with someone for a few sessions or multiple sessions to learn how to do it properly. You're going to get much more out of it. Uh, when you come to like the SFL, for example, and I know the SFB and SFG the same way too, you know, as uh, Louis Simmons, you know, made a comment about Powell many years ago, he knows how to reverse engineer what the best do. So when you come to the SFL, the techniques we teach you are my 20 years of powerlifting, all his years of experience added together. So mistakes that I may have made when I was younger or whatever else, uh, that I had to learn the hard way or from, you know, someone else is in there. So people walk away with top knowledge stuff right away. Don't be afraid to either pay for a certification to go to or, you know, to a trainer or whatever else that's already been to it to work with them. Um, I'll remember that the many years ago when I took my kids downhill skiing up here in Michigan, that uh, when Marcus first learned how to ski, I decided to go ahead and pay uh, for a, a private lesson for him. It was like $50 for an hour, but he got to work with an instructor one-on-one. Versus if you have, like, when you join, like, a group class, you got six kids and an instructor's trying to teach all of them. Right. And Marcus came away from that one hour learning more than I ever did when I took a group lesson when I was a young kid in Minnesota. Uh, so it's one of those things that, yeah, it costs money, but he learned more from that one session. He was able to ski better with the rest of us that time that we were up there and since that time. So, again, don't be afraid to, you know, I know money can be tight for some people, but sometimes you have to look at, you know, short-term pain, meaning pay the money out, but long-term gain because then you're not paying money to someone like me because you got hurt. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, 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 um, I think that's one of the, the, the things I appreciate the, the most about strong first is, and you touched on this earlier is, um, you know, it's not, you go there, you, yes, you're learning strength, but there's so much emphasis on, on technique and the nuances and subtlety of, again, whatever, um, discipline you're learning at that, at that time. Um, but I always walk away as a better teacher and an instructor. And I think that's like right. one of, one of the things that I really enjoy about going to the courses or the certifications is how much, you know, I'm learning as a student and then I can turn around and take that knowledge and, you know, share it with, with my clients and students. Exactly. Exactly. Which is going to then, for example, you coaching rowers is going to help out tremendously with that. Yes. You know, uh, again, back to Stu, Stu's podcast, he had a lot of good things to add about rowers. But then you also go to the body weight or the SFG one and you learn stuff from there that even though it's with kettlebells, you can apply some of that, uh, that, that biomechanics to as far as the rowing aspect. And get yes. These guys- absolutely, Doc. Doc, absolutely. Absolutely. I just got back. I was very, very uh, fortunate. Had the opportunity to uh, to assistant uh, coach uh, for the first uh, rowing camp at the the U.S. Naval Academy, which was uh, for a bunch of high school athletes. And um, you know, the the the, the first part of uh, depending on how it's taught, the coming out of the the finish or the release of the rowing stroke, you're moving on to the recovery. 
And right. the, the typical cue given to, to athletes is to move into the, the bodies over position. And when it's communicated that way to an athlete, the, the response uh, or reaction is to typically bend through either the thoracic or the lumbar spine. Um, so I got them up and off the, the erg. We were indoors for a session and I just had them, you know, kind of doing the, the hip hinge, touch the wall drill. And oh, we, yeah. and we did that for, for a couple minutes and just focus on, you know, bending at the hips. And I demonstrated here's a squat, maximal hip and knee flexion versus a hinge, maximal hip flexion, minimum knee flexion. And then doing that against the wall and then adding, okay, now when you stand up, I want you to think about initiating by pushing into the floor. And without saying anything, when they got onto the, the rowing machine, I said, okay, now I want you to go to the hip hinge position and just feel the weight transfer from the back of the seat to the front of the seat. And, oh, and that was, point. and completely changed the, the rowing stroke. And I had uh, several athletes come up to me at the, uh, today when we ended the first camp, um, and said that was like one of the best things that they learned all week. So what you'll be able to do from the future as far as, you know, decrease injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, yep. it, hinging through the hips, huge, huge, uh, piece to the rowing stroke. So very well, cool. It's more, it's more like rowing. You're not going to have the lower, let's say on your body, like we do a barbell. Right. Okay. Where, but you're going to have the repetition, 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 as far as if you're doing the wrong position, creating that micro trauma that down the road, you know, turns into, you know, season ending stuff, injuries, that kind of stuff. Yes, so. absolutely. Cool. All right. On to the rapid fire. Um, so Marcus, feel free to, to jump in on these. Okay. All right. So first question, Dr. Hartle. Given your, your current knowledge and uh, level exp of experience at this point in your life, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself uh, 10 years ago? 10 years ago? Hmm. Um, I would probably say uh, don't sit so much. Okay. And I say that because as I've gotten uh, more involved with a lot of these things, there's more emails, there's more as far as stuff like that. Even when I was uh, helping write the manual with Pavel, we're putting it together. Um, I know a lot of the uh, things nowadays, uh, Kelly Stair talks about a lot as far as the stand-up desk. Uh, definitely get one of those. Uh, and not so much that obviously I know sitting is obviously bad for you, but when you're, you know, most people answer emails. They do this kind of stuff. They obviously do the sitting thing. So it's one of those things that to uh, – to learn to get up and move more often. And sometimes you even, even my advice to patients, you know, I would not, in that case would not follow as much that I want to get this done, get this done, get this done, uh, get moving more often. Uh, that probably the thing. I mean, I'm not saying it was a bad thing, but it's one of those things where, uh, it did cause some issues for me as far as like that, some mobility issues that I had to address, uh, and everything else. Um, so awesome. about you, Mark, you're 14. So 10 years ago when you were four, what would you tell yourself nowadays? Uh, not slouch so much. <laughs> there you go. That's great. That's great. I love it. All right. Next question. What's your favorite? You had to pick one. What's your favorite strength training exercise? One. I would. I would say back squat. Awesome, Marcus. Yeah. Um, I really love Renegade rows. I don't know why they're just. This is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Um, Dr. Hartle, how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago? Oh, well, that was kind of like what I addressed earlier that, you know, back then I was trained for more absolute strength, mm -hmm. uh, whereas now I have to train for strength endurance. So I have to, it's like I tell my football players that, you know, help coach, I need to train for five quarters of football um, because if I train for four quarters, that means I'm exhausted at the end of those four quarters. Um, so I had to switch up my training from the absolute strength to strength endurance. So again, like I said, I had to go through those, you know, those processes of grieving and everything else and denial and give up that absolute strength. But then at the same time too, be able to last four quarters of football in 95 degree heat and in Indiana summers with full gear on and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that was a big change as far as, you know, giving up some of that absolute strength. It's nice to have the numbers I did before. Uh, I know I can't hit those now. Uh, but at some point I will get back to it. But right now, obviously the strength endurance aspect has been huge. Awesome. Awesome. 
Marcus, how's your how has your training changed over the last couple of years? Well, it's obviously gotten a lot more weight involved since I started out weight training uh, with my dad later than my brothers, but I was also a lot more busy with sports, so I couldn't didn't have enough time to do all the weight training. But yeah, a lot more weight training now than I did when I was younger. Awesome, awesome, um, Doctor Hartle. Have you uh, had an injury? And if so, how did that affect your training? Um, in 2009, uh, during a football game, I had a pretty severe ankle injury, my right ankle. Mm-hmm. I had an, an eversion sprain, which is the opposite. The typical one is inversion sprain where your ankle rolls out. I had rolled in. Actually, it was one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the offensive linemen of the team I was playing against landed on my leg. Uh, I, when I, he got off it, I expected to have, see my foot pointing a different direction than it should be pointing. Uh, Marcus is laughing because he remembers this because I had, it, did, it was, it ended up being a sprain. Uh, I was pointing the right direction, but I got helped off the field and a number of the guys on my team are like, oh my gosh, Doc is hurt. You know, what, what's going on here? And because up to that point, I never had an injury. Um, I drove to my clinic. Uh, I had my middle son, Anthony, who's 21 now, Marcus with me. And uh, I set up the x-ray machine. Uh, Anthony was behind the shield and pressed the button. Uh, so I took my own x-rays as far as the kids uh, helping me out with that. Developed them, found I did not break my ankle. Um, got treated right away. Of course, that hurt like uh, nothing other to get that treated. Um, you, have you heard, you've heard of cankles, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I had a thankle. So thankle. <laughs> yes, I, had, I had swelling. Uh, it was pretty bad I, all the way up to my thigh. So hence the word thankle instead of cankle, uh, black and blue. Uh, matter of fact, I even used a cane for a bit at my office. I wore, uh, flip flops at my clinic for a while because I couldn't fit my foot in the shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, but three weeks later, I was able to play again. Um, but it did, you know, it was interesting. It did affect, I wore a brace for the rest of that season and, um, uh, got rid of the brace after the season was over, really worked on rehabbing it, getting the mobility back and everything else and all that stuff. But it was interesting though, because it did actually cause some issues up in my, uh, hip and sacroiliac area as well, too, um, that were compensating. But I got those taken care of and everything else. So that was probably the more severe injury in the last, you know, 10 years that I had to deal with. Wow. Wow. Um, Marcus, have you have you had an injury? And how, how did that uh, affect your training if you did have one? Well, actually, I've had, uh, I've had a few hip injuries and tailbone injuries. But recently, the one that affected me the most was during my hockey season. And I had gotten checked in the back, and I landed on the ice, and my, like, pants had slid down, so it was just, like, my hip, bare bone on the ice. And I actually, like, it was painful to, like, walk and, Mm. like, just move my legs and stuff. And I actually, now when we're doing squats, I'm noticing a little bit of that is still, like, there. So we're still working on it to help, like, get my squat better and improve my hips. Yeah, he landed right on his sacrum, which then obviously, you know, sprained the ligaments on both sides as far as right and left sacroiliac joints. And which then, as we, we, uh, know from the, how the body, the fascia works, you know, those hamstrings tie right into the sacrum's tuberous ligament all the way up like that. So we had a lot of work to do back there and, and get rid of that. And, you know, again, that's one of those things where, you know, it's just part of a sport contact sport. That stuff happens. Sure. And, sure. Uh, but, uh, his, uh, dear old dad and his, uh, mother helped put him back together and, and uh, he's, he's here to live another day. There you go. Sounds like you're you're doing good and making great strides. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. What's one thing high school athletes should be doing more of to complement their their training and their health? You know, I, w- I would say is, is posture. Okay. Big posture. Um, I would say that, you know, again, you know, like I tell my patients that, you know, bad posture will do more damage to your body than a car accident will. And wow. Say, they say, what, what are you talking about? Well, the thing is, is that if you go and have a car accident, say so you get whiplash and you also uh, sprain your lower back, okay, or do whatever else to your body, that that is an injury that happens acutely right at that moment. Uh, your nervous system, wired-wise, is not used to it. So if you come in for treatment right away and we start treating you and everything else, we can usually get you, you know, healthy in a very fast fashion. But if you have bad posture, what happens is your central nervous system starts to assume that, oh, I guess this is what normal posture is. This is what my neutral is. And so trying to overcome that means not only do we have to fix what's wrong, because usually bad posture turns a chronic into an acute injury, 
not only do you have to fix that injury, but now you also have to retrain the body. And like everyone knows, you know, from Greg Cook to Craig Levinson to even, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Yanda and everything else that when you have to redo, when you learn a new motor pattern, it doesn't take very many repetitions. When you have to correct an abnormal motor pattern, it takes many, many more repetitions, thousands of repetitions of correcting that form because now you're having to rewire that synaptic, you know, pathway inside the brain to say, okay, no, this is how it should be. And so probably I would say to high school kids nowadays, because, you know, we spend so much time, the kids do with their thumbs. They have great thumb mobility, great thumb dexterity. Uh, right, Marcus? Right? Yeah, okay. Um, that uh, they tend to sit in positions for long periods of time, whereas you go back to, like, uh, even uh, Marcus's mother, that when she lived on a farm and grew up, she had to do a lot of physical work. Right. You know, I grew up in a city, but we still mowing the yard and helping weed the garden and doing this and all that stuff. And, you know, even trim the grass around the fences. So you're doing a lot of bending. You're doing a lot of this kind of stuff and everything else. Kids don't do much of that anymore. Right. So again, proper posture is, is extremely important um, to do that, which will carry over. Cause we see it. I see it in track and field. You see it in the weight room and stuff like that. These kids come in with bad posture. Um, and they don't, again, they don't necessarily know they have bad posture and you start teaching them movements, kettlebell, deadlift, swings, back squats, all this kind of stuff. You know, they got their heads poking, their chins poking one way. They got this rounded thoracic spine. They got poor hip mobility, all that kind of stuff. All these things now you have to work on correcting and addressing. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they didn't have a lot of these things where they sat down their butts. I remember having contests with my brother and my sister and kid neighborhood kids where who could walk down the curb the longest before you, you know, fell off. I mean, like a balance beam, so to speak. Right. Climbing, those kind of things. So kids don't do that. So. I would say to a high school kid, watch your posture. When your parents tell you to sit up, sit up. Uh, it's extremely important because the ramifications of the learning that bad stuff years down the road is tough. Awesome. I love it. Marcus, what's, what's one thing you've, uh, you think you've really benefited, benefited from, um, that's helped your, your training and your health? What do you mean by that? Like in terms of the, like some of the, you know, training that you've done with your, with your father, uh, what's one thing that like kind of jumps out at you that that's helped you, um, you know, overall just, you feel like you're moving well, but it's also helped you in, in your sports. Um, definitely the mobility exercises because I'm pretty tight, especially in like my legs and my muscles. So my mobility exercises have definitely helped me become more agile and faster. So that definitely helped a lot. And I think also too, adding, you know, some things like today we were talking about the back squat work with that of uh, attention to detail, mm-hmm. you know, like for example, the back squat, when he gets set up, you know, he stands up in the rack and then he right. steps back. You know, you see a lot of people that will just, because of even the weight's light, they'll just get set up in the rack and they'll just basically fly backwards at a 45 degree angle with the bar. Whereas you need to kind of like, you know, do it like the get up, you know, you have to go from the floor to the elbow, to the tall sit, to the sweep, to as far as a half kneeling, to standing and reverse that. And yes, you can make it fluid, but you still have to have all those parts together to make a get up. Same thing here too with this year. We were talking about that today that, you know, you need to stand up first. And even though the weight he's using is very light, okay, step back and get set up. If you rush it down the road, when you start, if you learn that as a pattern down the road, he's going to have, you know, uh, some problems as far as getting a squat set up. So attention to detail is probably something also too. It's important. Beautiful. Uh, Dr. Hartle, what is your best tip to help improve recovery, uh, after a training session? Bleep. Simple. Bleep. I love Bleep. it. I love Bleep. it. I mean, obviously I'm also a board certified nutritionist. So I would say that, you know, proper nutrition, mm-hmm. you know, if you're eating at Wendy's all the time or whatever else, as much as I like their spicy chicken sandwiches, um, and everything else that, you know, it's not one of those things you need to be doing, but yeah, it's, you know, recovery and recuperation is as much or sometimes even more important than the actual training itself. Um, you need to get that recovery. I mean, I'm guilty as charged here. Sometimes I don't always get the sleep that I need to get and stuff like that. But, uh, sleep is one of the things that you, that's when your body recovers. That's when, you know, growth hormones release, you know, testosterone, all these different things as far as, you know, as far as, uh, people, athletes and stuff like that, you need to have that recovery. And your body does a lot of that. I would say second thing, if I can add a second thing, sure, is making sure your flexibility and mobility stay there, whether it be through static stretches, which I'm a big fan of, but also through dynamic mobility as well, too. 
Uh, those are some big things as far as recovery that you need to be able to do that to help, you know, again, kind of like a very similar to a grease to groove type thing that Pavel talks about a lot, uh, but obviously with no weight in this case and the mobility, but you got to keep that mobility. Excellent. Mark, Marcus, anything to add? Um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. Dr. Hartle. All right. You got one meal. What would you have for one meal? What's your, like, what's your favorite meal? I would have filet mignon. Well done. I know my uh, good friend Fabio in uh, Italy is probably rolling right now. He likes his meat rare. Um, I have it well done. Um, I don't eat too many baked potatoes, but every, you know, a good baked potato with some uh, some hot butter and stuff like that. And then after that, have a uh, a Italian cake called Torta Ticolata. Nice. If I pronounce that right, it's basically all chocolate. Nice. So that, nice. that would be uh, a meal. Um, obviously, I probably have some vegetables of that too, so some steamed broccoli or something like that uh, to that as well too. But filet mignon, well done. I was in South Africa here back in uh, end of February, early March for the SFL down there, and uh, Sean Carnes and uh, as far as uh, Scott McIntosh went out to dinner. And at that point, the U.S. dollar was very strong against the South African rand. So I got a 500 gram, which is about 17.6 ounces filet mignon, uh, inexpensive. Oh, well done. It was just, the beef was just unreal. Um, so that's yeah, awesome. it was just amazing, but that's, that's what I would get. Awesome. All right, Marcus, how about you? Well, mine would be also filet mignon with, but medium well or medium. I don't like it. Well done. It's burnt. I don't like that. But then I'd have a side of some mashed potatoes and gravy and some green beans. Nice. 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 Excellent. All right. Final question for both of you. What's one book everyone should read? You know, I read a big book many years ago. And it's not well known, but it's called Evolve the Brain. Okay. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, uh, who's also a chiropractic physician, um, uh, wrote it. And it really opened my eyes to uh, the neuroplasticity of the brain. A lot of times we tend to think that uh, we were taught that pretty much by telling someone who's four or five, maybe even like nine or 10, their personalities are pretty much set in motion and that, you know, they're not going to change, whatever else. Uh, and in this book, he talks about it. It's for the layperson as much as it is the doctor. Um, talks about how you can change things, how if you really want to do it. And it's not, let's say, a motivational book. It's more scientific proven mm -hmm. like that. Um, he basically kind of got the idea from, you know, interviewing how, you know, a cancer patient would have a spontaneous remission, things like that. And of course, he found out that those people were generally happier in nature. They had a good personality, a lot of kind of stuff versus people who, who didn't have that. And I've seen that in clinical practice too, that, you know, I could have a patient with a small problem come in that should be very easily taken care of, um, but with a very poor attitude. And they would either take forever to get fixed uh, or just not at all. And then sometimes I have to have a sit down talk with them saying, Hey, you're not helping me help you. What can we do to get you better? Uh, whereas I've had other people who are coming in, you know, crawling on their hands and knees. It's a very severe problem. So you would probably give a very small percentage chance of healing, but they come in with a great attitude. They do everything you ask them to do. And amazingly they, they get better. So again, the mind's a very powerful thing. And again, it's not a psychological text, but it's called evolve your brain. And he's have called some other, uh, uh, books after that but i think that one is one that really opened my eyes to again learning that hey the body is not as you know set in stone as it is you know you can really change things awesome i'll, I'll definitely uh be checking that out because i'm a big fan of uh the brain that changes itself by norman deutrich and uh spark yeah, very, spark yeah yep very similar awesome marcus what's one book everyone should read is this book allowed to be a series <laughs> sure yeah yeah why not then definitely the Hunger Games series. <laughs> All right. All right. That is a fantastic series. I love those books. Awesome. Awesome. I was trying to get him to read War and Peace, but he decided not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, Doc, Marcus, any closing thoughts before we wrap up? 
No, I'm just uh, honored and humbled to uh, be a guest here. So I appreciate the the time you put together with this and and everything. So uh, looking forward to uh, to listening it down the road, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you both. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to come on and, and making it happen. And um, very very honored to have you both here. And uh, happy happy Father's Day to you, Doctor Harl. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, sir. <laughs> awesome. So just hang on the line. Let me give you both a proper goodbye, and we will wrap this episode up. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Michael Hardle and his son, Marcus. If you enjoy the content, I greatly appreciate it. If you would take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes and drop in a five-star review. It really helps the show to grow, reach new audiences, and potentially help me gain sponsorship. Please be sure to tune in next week when we have Mac Lemon, a triathlete, on the show. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.